Thank you all for coming today. I appreciate you coming to a talk and demonstration on use of a dedicated video studio space. Um, we're going to consider three areas today, space, light, and sound. And in making use of that space, we're going to talk about the dedicated use of it, the mobile use of it, and how it can be a collaborative space also. I'm actually reading from the, uh, the, the one page, you don't have this, describes of what we're doing. So the question comes up, how does one make use of a fixed and a dedicated video studio space? This includes, and please look around as I speak of this, making use of the paint on the walls, curtains, the flooring, coves, which I'll describe to you later, sound pockets, fixtures, practicals, compass points, grid layouts, and most importantly, imagination within this space. Okay, so, how does one make use of fixed and mobile lighting, sources and fixtures, devices, and a dedicated studio space? Uh, this may include the overhead powered lighting grid with fixed and movable lighting fixtures or portable lighting stands. Uh, these may be either land or battery powered. And how does one make use of fixed and mobile sound? Sources and fixtures, recording and playback devices in a dedicated studio space. This includes making use of speakers, microphones and other audio tools within the space. So. No, no, I'll do it. I'll do it. Thank you. <clears throat> so, that was the um, goals and objectives the, for the pedagogical people. That was describing what the uh, talk is going to be about, and now we'll go into the talk itself. We are meeting to discover the various ways we can use a production space. Look around you again. This space is neutral but it is not a natural area. What does that mean, neutral? It means that it can be anything, as I said, that your imagination might make it. It has no definition, no boundary. It's just a space. But as I stated earlier, it is not a natural space because there is no sunshine, there is no birds, animal sounds, people, it is entirely an artificial construct. <clears throat> it is capable, again, as I said, of being whatever you can make of it. It is a space to be filled up, adjusted, and finally defined for your use. It is a tool to complement your script and actions. It can be used for a singular person-to-person -person presentation, or a person to group presentation, or a collaborative space mixing up a variety of presentations, or all of the above, some people use. It can sometimes be defined in space as analogous of a tabla rasa mind of a person, that is, ready to be written onto and worked within to meet potential learning goals and objectives. For those of you who have not heard of tabla rasa, it is a psychological social term which means an empty space to be written upon. Many times they talk about the mind of a child being a tabla rasa, which means that a child can learn from the environment around them, not only their parents, but society, nature, and things like that. This studio space is a tabla rasa for production. It can lead you to develop your presentation skills, either within this area or within a learning space outside of this area. Or it can help you in planning how to transfer your own expressions and teaching into other learning spaces. One of the uh, 
most difficult things that uh, we are faced with is not the technology and what is available because you know that only takes money and uh, knowledge but the hardest thing is to translate what a professor uh, is speaking about a professor is teaching and transferring that knowledge into a space where other people can receive that knowledge. This space, again, not natural, an artificial space, can help us. It becomes a tool in that activity. <clears throat> I'm going to be putting these things down, so, so I make sure I cover everything. We will also explore how we model, test, and develop media ideas, which can be used in the studio and extended to other spaces outside on the campus. Okay, I want you to direct your attention here, and I'm going to present now a sample of what I call exploration. We will begin by exploring this immediate video media production area and its possibilities. Like I say, this is only a sample to kind of get the juices flowing. Let's take a look at the walls and the floor. Look around you and imagine a space that will do what you want it to do or help you find out what will work best in future video projects. <coughs> also note how this imagined space will transfer to other spaces outside of the studio. Okay, does anyone... I know it's cold in here, so it's a little tough to get people to talk about things, but what kind of things can you imagine being in this kind of space? Anyone speak up? You're not going to necessarily be on camera, but your voices might be picked up. <coughs> what, do you, what do you think about when you're confronted with a presentation that you have to uh, make to a larger group, make to a single person? What do you see the potential is in this space? looking at the walls and the floors and things like that. Any ideas? A stage. Okay, a stage. What else? Um, maybe a place where we can like, conduct interviews or um, talk one-on-one -on -one with people in a more controlled environment. Okay, one-on-one, -on -one, uh, talking with people. What other things do you see? I see visual things, you know, what's behind the person. Is there something you can do to um, make the space somehow relate to whatever you're talking about um, or make it look like a professional space, sort of like a TV studio you'd see on the news or something? Okay. Or maybe someone's interior of their home or interior of an office building. Or even, um, I think as we'll see, a late, see later, um, the uh, street scene in a Latin American country where you can learn to cha-cha. <laughs> so there are a lot of things that an empty space can be uh, useful for, for imagination. Okay, I'm going to give you some points of reference now in the studio. Please make note of the four compass points in the space to arrange your bearings and help plot the most effective use of the available walls. Okay. Uh, at least uh, in this studio, I have placed near the ceiling actual compass points so that when you come in here or you plot something out that you want to use the space you'll notice that on the walls there are uh, notations that say east and west and north and south so that if you stand in the center of the studio and you give a direction to someone or to the camera operator you can tell them look to the north look to the east not just saying turn left or right because if I change my position in the studio, left and right is relative to me. This is my left here, but if I turn and stand at another portion of the studio, it would be in a different location. So establish a compass point in your studio so that when you are designing sets, 
preparing graphics and things like that for presentation, you want to have some kind of common language. So establish a compass point. Note then the different colors on the walls. I got the walls pretty much covered here, but they're kind of basic 40% gray. But you kind of see peeking behind some things. You see blue, you see green, you see what you think is white. And you also notice that there are scrims or curtains that are different colors. Kind of a reddish brown, kind of a tannish white. Behind the camera, which you can't see right now, is a black curtain. Now, besides adding color, uh, we'll find out later that curtains and scrims, wall fixtures, carpeting, and things like that actually affect the sound in the studio. David, one question. Why are the sure. walls 40% gray? because it is a common lighting percentage so that um, when you have the house lights on, the work lights, it's an even color um, and reflectivity uh, in the studio. Um, from there, you can add color, subtract color, increase the intensity of white to dark, and things like that. So we start with a basic 40% gray. Okay, notice things on the floor. You can kind of see uh, something that looks kind of 40% white. You also see black tiles. Um, you might, in a, a situation, have carpeting put on the floor. You might have uh, real Spanish tile put down. You could have stone or other things that you would put on the flooring. Uh, right now the basic studio has a black tile. It's not quite matte, it has a slight reflectivity, but it also makes the floor very smooth. So that if you're doing anything with motion in the studio, uh, whether it be walking or tracking a camera or something like that, you have a smooth surface to work with. And it's a quiet surface and a non-sticky surface, which also helps in your production. Notice too that uh, even though the color here is fairly bland, it can add accent or uh, draw the eye's attention to certain things if you use different colors within the studio on the walls or add them to it. Okay, I think now we've had an introduction to what I've been talking about with the idea with exploring the floors and walls of the studio. Let's get into the fun things that we can do with the studio that we actually manipulate it with. I'm going to lead this exploration by using what I have on this table. Just a little not magical, but a little demonstration piece which will help us visually attune to the discussion. All right? You have in front of you a black cube. It's just a set piece. Doesn't do anything right now. Doesn't have any particular color or anything attached to it, but it is again a blank form that we can do something with. Okay, so first let us explore lighting and I think everyone has uh, a handout that says lighting and thanks to Melody Toon in the graphics department we have a symbol which describes lighting. I'm also wearing something on my shirt which describes lighting, a lighting fixture hung from the wall or from the ceiling, shining light uh, into a dark space. Kind of like what we want to do, or what professors do, kind of shining uh, information into students' minds or even in their own studies to increase the knowledge that they've been working on themselves. Okay, <clears throat> I'm now going to uh, do something which we do all the time in the studio. I'm going to turn the work lights off and we're going to look at different kinds of light using our uh, mannequin here. We're very privileged here at San Diego State in our studio to have uh, a lighting grid 
Not all studios have that, which means that uh, uh, they have to bring lights in. Okay, good. So, most lighting is involved with illuminating something. We want the light to show something. So I'm going to bring up what is known as a key light on our model. And you will notice now that our model suddenly appears out of the darkness as if the sun has come up. And I brought the lighting up uh, slowly enough so it looked somewhat like a sunrise. And you notice in the back we just have a, a, uh, a whitish gray background. But I want you to pay attention to the lighting on the mannequin, please. So right now, as we look at the mannequin, and you can look at me also, you can see that the light is rather flat. There is nothing showing any features or anything particularly interesting about the mannequin. So it would be the same thing if you walked outdoors on a sunny day or a cloud-filled day with a kind of constant light, okay? Now let's add some different light to the mannequin. If you notice now that the mannequin's face is not lit, but there's a great deal of light on the back, sometimes called a hair light or a back light, which now drives the figure and the image of the mannequin away from the background. Not particularly interesting stuff when we talk about lighting, but it is, all comes together in how your professor or your uh, presenter is looked at, okay? So if we now add lights, and we're not going to talk about colors and things like that in this presentation, but now we have a key light and a hair light. So now you can see that the mannequin not only stands out from the background, but also has a little bit of more natural look. Okay, going to introduce a third piece of lighting, dramatic lighting. So now you notice that the uh, mannequin has almost established some expression. Oftentimes seen in the movies to create a situation of tension and fear, we've now introduced lighting from the bottom. Why is that done? Well, because it's not natural. Again, remember, this is not a natural space. We're controlling the light. There are very few places in the world where you can stand on the outside and be lit from the bottom. And that's what we've done here. Now we're going to do the opposite and now light the mannequin from the top. Again, a whole different dramatic presentation with the lighting. I kind of call this my um, Phantom of the Opera look. You notice that half of the face is more in shadow than the other. So again, we've now changed how the person looks. Why is this important? Well, for dramatic presentations, it's very important. But when you're in a classroom, traditional classroom, you have a situation where everything is rather broadly lit. There's no interest in the features of the presenter. The teacher, depending on what they're wearing, the professor, whether or not they have a coat or a jacket or a sweater, looks kind of like everyone else. But with a little bit of modeling light that you can introduce, you can somewhat bring the presentation out from the background. So you can make it interesting to the people around. You say, well, why would I want to make it interesting? People in the video business spend 
multi-millions of dollars to gain your attention. They want people to stand out. They want the message to become clear and maybe only in 10 seconds. So we want to do the same thing because we're all consumers of this, whether it be a consumer in an education situation or in an advertising commercial situation. We want the person who's making the presentation to be an interesting presentation. So now I'm going to take this out and I'm going to bring back the key light and bring back the back lights and say, okay, that's pretty cool. I'm not quite sure whether or not a little modeling light might show the uh, mannequin in a little bit different manner. Okay, so now there's a little contour to the face and something like that. Again, we're in an unnatural environment and you can say, oh well, uh, why do I go to the trouble? I go to the trouble because in video, the sensor on the camera, the image on the still is all that you have to convey it. And the human eye can do a lot more than what the camera can see. David, what is the modeling like doing that the key light and back light are not doing? Okay. Let me turn. Oh, by changing the percentage, you can create tension. Let's see, where's my other C? What do I want? No, not yet. See is up. Oh, here. You're drawing attention to the person, uh, and that's why you want to use modeling light. Now, I'm going to bring these rather warm and strong lights down to a medium light, and I'm now going to show you what we can do a little bit with the portable lighting. <coughs> I think this is a little bit too dramatic, personally, for what we normally do in here. So now, again, there's a whole study that you can do with the different kinds of lights, and that's something that you study. You study lighting. You study adding gels or colored pieces of plastic in front of the lights so that you can change the actual physical color on the face. But this, though there's some interesting contour here, and you can, it's not particularly interesting. And also, again, we've almost taken a dark room and made it a flat room. We might as well have not turned the lights on at all and just left the room lights on, like 99% of the rooms are in the classrooms. Okay, just kind of a flat light. Great for taking notes, not for establishing any interest in the presenter. So, let's take a portable light, and I'm going to take a spotlight, and let's see what we can do with the light. Again, we could talk about color temperature, that is uh, the actual frequency of light that the camera sees, but right now we're just going to do a basic idea of what's the difference when we throw light on a figure. In the camera's eye, without making adjustments, the figure has become very washed out, very bright. But you notice now that I can restore more difference with that. And basically, I'm, re I'm replacing the key light with a light very much closer. But we're very lucky again that we have portable lights so we don't have to plug in and have a studio. Like that, but I, you know, I am uncomfortable that the one side of the face is a little darker than the other because there's so much light here. So let's take a floodlight or a more broad light. <coughs> and 
and introduce a way to kind of bring a little bit more texture to the face by doing that. Okay? So now you can see what happens when you do different kinds of things with lights. And remember, when we started talking about this, you want to be able to transfer what you have in this unnatural space. We have a lot of control with lighting and things. We want to be able to take it into the classroom when we're making a video presentation. So now you can see that you can do some of the similar things to model with light, to show light and dark spaces by bringing a couple of lighting fixtures with you and changing it. Again, why do we do this? Reiterate, to bring the subject away from the background, to bring the subject back to the point of interest in the presentation. That's the reason why we do it. So we try and make something different than the everyday presentation. He says, gee, we've been here half an hour and all we looked at is the modeling dummy. It's all right. We've got something else to look at soon. Okay, don't be surprised when we take some lights out here. And now, I want to show you another thing that we can do in the studio. And that's to create an even more artificial environment within an artificial environment. And that's to use green screen technology. So wow, all of a sudden, you've got a green wall to look at. Now, some people who have worked in television and in media know that electronically we can remove that green and put anything we want behind the object. So now I'm going to show an example of green screen technology. We're not going to actually do it, but I want to show some of the things that we are capable of doing with green screen technology here on this campus. So let's take a look first at um, a basic green screen model. If you notice that this miniature baseball player is sitting in front of the green screen. And if you have a lot of fun, you can make the figure rotate. Now just imagine what you could do with a rotating model in front of a green screen that you now put in front of a baseball stadium with people cheering behind them and lights flashing and runners running the bases and things like that, all of which you could imagine now in your mind behind this figure. This is the hardest part, I keep losing the cursor. think. Let's take a look at something that we've created here at San Diego State using the green screen. Come on. Thank you. 
Yes, it was filmed in here. How'd you get the floor on the green side? Um, we extend the black and uh, it reflects up slightly at the green temperature and we still punch out that. I love this idea of what we could do with these. Okay, we could look at other things. I think it's kind of neat to see what green screen can do. It takes you completely out of the image and puts you in a completely different space. Okay. All right. Guess what? It's time to go to sound. We've spent, oh, a few minutes now talking about the environment we're in and lighting. So let's take a look at sound now. Sound is critical to focusing attention to the content. As in lighting, the subject picking up the best sound of the speaker or sound source is critical. It is a tool used to focus the listener in a directed manner on the subject one is listening to and paying directed attention. It is also used in, in the response portion of a sending and receiving of information in collaboration of sharing information in many sharing situations. A lot of complicated words saying that I speak to you, you listen to what I say, and then you can speak to me and I listen to you, what you have to say. And then as a group, if we speak to each other, we collaborate and share using sound. Okay, since you've had a really nice opportunity, we're gonna take this and we're gonna turn the chairs around and go over to the learning glass presentation area. We have all kinds of interesting things we can do with sound in the studio. In fact, we just heard interesting things in sound as we turned the chairs around. We heard a squeaky floor. We had heard a little chuckling in the background as people made noises and things like that. And uh, this portion is going to be tough for the camera and we might have to uh, introduce the sound in a different way. But you are going to get a chance to experience sound in a multiple of ways. So, when we're in a studio, right now, the sound is coming from my voice. And the things that are on the floor, covering the walls, and uh, the, the way I use my voice um, changes the perception. And I'm going to do something right now and just kind of follow me around and just see what I'm going to do here. just have to do it. It's not really anything exciting, but you just have to do it. I'm going to step out of camera here for a moment.
and you'll see why I'm doing this in a moment. I've just now changed the entire sound of the studio. If you can hear with your own ears right now, the studio seems to have a higher frequency. My voice just went up in pitch. That's because the sound I'm making with my mouth is now bouncing off a whole bunch of hard walls. With the curtains drawn, it had all these nice soft surfaces to absorb the sound. So the pitch of my voice went down. The same thing we have here is a hard surface and something that we have to deal with when we have a presenter using the learning glass is that whether they're wearing a microphone here or maybe looking at a microphone from the ceiling or whatever, their voice will change because the voice bounces off the glass surface. It doesn't pass through the surface. It bounces off and comes back to whatever is picking up the sound. So we're going to talk about several different kinds of microphones. Then we're going to go over to a listening station and people can actually hear the different sounds. Okay, so uh, this normally lives in our almost real audio recording booth. It's a very high quality microphone. I have a filter on here which uh, physically interrupts the sound so that you don't hear a lot of slurping and spitting sounds and things like that, but it helps shape the sound. I have another microphone here that uh, is more like you see in uh, recording studios and things like that, where the guy says, and now we're going to have a word from our sponsor. Okay, why does, I got a question for you. We didn't talk much in the lighting to get a discussion going. Why does the announcer do this? You always see that in the movies or whatever. By cupping your hand over the ear, it increases the sound you can hear by about 6 dB. So it actually amplifies it without any electronics. Okay, another microphone we have is a shotgun microphone, which I have suspended from the ceiling. And, you know, I was listening to that this morning and I realized, ah, I didn't turn it on. So I'm going to turn it on. This has a little amplifier built in, which helps uh, the sound that's reproduced by it. And then we have the good old-fashioned lavalier microphones. And I have two of them on this one clip. One which is wired and one which is transmitted like the microphone that I'm wearing through the air. And the capsules or the sound pickup area is different on each one of these. So the sound will be different. So when I wear this, you can actually hear a different sound even though the mic is in the same position. So let's go over to the listening station. Okay. I'm going to ask you just because you're closest, I'm going to ask you, um, when I say what, when I give you a number, just press here and that will turn the microphone on so everybody can hear it. Okay, so the camera is going to be recording your um, reactions, all right, to different kinds of sound. <laughs> oh, is something really loud? Okay, that's all right. That's, a, that's part of the fun of doing this. Okay, do you want to press number one, please? And now we are testing the microphone that we most often use for voiceover recordings in the studio. And I am talking into a hard surface so that I get the amount, uh, maximum amount of reflection in the audio booth, we would have a lot of soft surfaces so that the microphone would only pick up what the speaker is talking about. Okay, ready for mic two? Turn off mic one 
and put on mic two. Okay, whole different sound. Even though you're wearing the same type of headphones, the sound being reproduced on this microphone is entirely different, even though I'm also talking into a hard surface, which is the learning glass surface. David, what were okay. you using that microphone for? It's a microphone that could be used in recording voiceovers. It also could be used in a classroom where you wanted really, really high quality sound. Okay? All right, let's go to number three. This one's going to sound dramatically different because this is the shotgun microphone. It's the one that's suspended from the ceiling. And this is the one that we use quite often in the field. But you notice that the fidelity or the presence of the microphone is in very different from the one that's kind of controlled where you're talking closely. Okay, so that is the shotgun. Okay, you want to put number four up? Okay, number four. One you see all the time in churches, in band shells, all kinds of things. An omnidirectional microphone. Can you hear it? Yeah. yeah. An omnidirectional microphone right over my head. So you don't have to move anything. You don't have to do walk around. It's always there. And right now it's about six inches over my head. That's a good distance, but maybe not so good for the camera. So you might have to make adjustments like you would with the shotgun. Okay, let's go to number five. Yeah, number five. Okay, number five is the lavalier that I'm wearing. And if I remember correctly, it's the wired lavalier. Doesn't that have a nice ta sound? Really nice sound, well-rounded, picks up my voice very well. Now change to number six. No, okay? Okay, seven and eight then, whatever, yeah. yeah. The next button. Yeah, that one's loud, yeah. Oh, that one's really loud? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's the one that's tough. Okay. <laughs> Oh, I can see it. It's Always really... Oh, good. Okay, so you got to figure it out. You can really tell that it's working because the eyes get very large when someone's listening. But you notice how, how really alive that is. And you notice if I do this, or if I stomp, you can actually hear the floor. Wait, which one's this? That's the wired This is the wireless. That's the wireless microphone. That's why we use it. It's kind of a general purpose microphone. Okay. All right. Take the headphones off. Reset the mixing board. And let's have the other three people take a listen. Please. Yeah, we have about 10 minutes. That's all right. We'll be done. So, um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Well, I want you to hear it, Don. And I want him to hear it, too. So go ahead. Okay, okay, let's turn on number one, please. Is the master down? <laughs> Wait, no, he just didn't. Just un unclick uh, mute. Okay. okay, this is the uh, microphone that we use in the uh, recording booth to hear uh, voiceover recordings. Notice you can hear how hard the surface is. Okay, let's go on to number two. Now you hear number two's microphone. A little different, isn't it? Different sound completely. Okay, let's go to number three. Number three is the shotgun microphone. Again, the most popular microphone used. Whole different sound, and you can hear around the outside. Okay, let's go to number four. One, two, three, four. Now you're listening to the omnidirectional microphone over my head. The reason you need to listen to these things is because it's, it's tools that you can use 
then now you begin to understand in your head why the different microphones. Now let's go to number 5-6, which is the wired lavalier microphone right here. And let's go to 7 and 8. That's the one that's loud. Okay? All right. If you gentlemen will help me, would you pull that drape all the way across the studio? Yeah, pull that one too. <laughs> okay, now go ahead and put 5-6 uh, on. That won't be so loud. 5-6 is 7-8. 5-6. 5-6 is a good one. That's a common one that we use. But you notice now that the room has got... You, we've changed the sound of the room. I would pull the one in the back too. Yeah, okay. But you notice, I haven't done anything. I haven't changed the microphone I'm wearing, but the sound that you hear is completely different. Okay, thanks. Let's come and go back to the other side. One of the exciting things about using a studio is how we can think mentally how to um, take what we do in here and take it out someplace else into the learning spaces on campus. Or if we are assigned to do something um, in an off-campus site where a presenter is. I remember most recently we were at the president's house and it was a challenging video situation because it was actually a presentation. We just were there to document it. So how do you make it look interesting and still not disturb what the function was? This is think the thinking part of how we use this space and that's why you've got notes there. Now that we've seen the basic pieces that make up the video studio and have made the investment in the equipment, time, and talent for a video production, the questions come up. Is this worth the cost and effort to have this type of space available for all of us to use? Will you make use of it effectively to meet your project's goals and objectives? Okay? It's a question. If you've got a client in, on the various things that you're doing, are you going to suggest that they come over and use the studio? Maybe, because you now know that the space has a lot of things that could be used for. What do we mean by thinking outside the box? We now must think about how the lighting, sound, and studio space adjustments that we have created are going to be perceived by the audience. Some questions now. Will our audience be a single viewer, listener, a small group? with or without collaboration, or a large group of individuals, each one of those individuals with their own perception. Remember, we don't deal with robots. Every single person in a large space sees the presenter in a different manner. Again, we ask this question, will the audience be in traditional settings, at home, in a large lecture hall, or on a small screen of a mobile device? That changes the perception, okay? If they're at home in their pajamas, sitting in a comfortable chair or at their dining room table, it's entirely different than when they're watching this at the library on a hard table. Or they are watching or perceiving the presenter in a large 500-seat classroom where people are making noises and people are walking in and out and all these kinds of things. It changes the perception of what you're presenting. Okay, we could go in. Uh, this was a portion where we could have some discussion. So, what do you think? Do you think that it's a good idea to think outside the box? Come on in. We've got some people that are joining us. Do you think it's a good idea to think outside the box? Because in this box, we know that it's not a natural space. We've established that. We've changed the sound, we've changed the vision, and we've changed the environment. But now you're taking it out to a natural space, or to a classroom, or a home setting. What do you think? When you think outside the box, what does this kind of space teach you? Go ahead. Okay. Instead of having it be like detrimental to your video, instead use it to be like something that benefits the video. Yeah. 
something that can really bring something forward. Or if there's a lot of noise, how do you get that noise thing? Anything else? You have an idea for us? Um, well, I like the use of the green screen where it wasn't just the wall, it was them standing on the cobblestone road and, and they were saying that that was actually an accident. So like working with the accidents that happen to have a better finished product. Right. How about our graphics people? What do you think about thinking out of the box? Well, I think it's nice that we have to console all the all these elements, you know, so that you can really so you're not if you go out and about and it might be a difficult situation that might not be the best way to go, but you can bring it here and set it up so that you can control it. Okay. Now I'm going to kind of ask this because I'm going to sh reveal the last one. Okay. This is a question and answer section. We don't have a lot of time because it's now the end of the presentation. But we can now take this video environment to the final production using just what we have in the studio. A question we do have to ask is do we add effects in post production or do we have enough raw material or created B roll to make a final video? Okay. So you've got to think about the box in a different way. Not just what we can control in here, but now what we can add or enhance to what we've already shot. So you have the idea that you can create B-roll in here. If something didn't work out, you might be able to recreate it here. You might be able to add another dimension here, like sound or visuals. Something that wasn't able to be gotten. Um, I'm a firm believer in not using the old tried and true system of fix it in post. Post production means that you're spending a lot of your time and your talent trying to fix things that you've forgotten about. So use the box inside, use the thinking that you have here and take it to the outside and then bring it back in to create a more effective presentation. Finally, can we make a good use and repeatable use of all the possibilities afforded to us when we have at our disposal a dedicated video production space? Yeah, this is part of the canned part of my speech, but it's an asset, I think, to have something like this. And it's an asset that we can share with other people on campus. We're not a teaching studio to teach lighting and things like that, but we are an enhancement space that we can offer something that's different from the traditional classroom. Okay, so my very last reveal. Everybody said to me, why did you bring a magical black box in here? So, because Everyone likes to have something magical at the end. I'm going to do it for you. Okay, are you ready? Here it comes. I quite literally did pull a rabbit out of the box. <laughs> Thank you very much for being with us today for this presentation.